thank you everybody for hanging in to this hour. I, um, I'm so thrilled to be here. I uh, really appreciated the uh, kind invitation and uh, I really learned a lot today. It really has been fantastic. So I wanted to um, uh, first, uh, I think he told me my, uh, oh, here we go, okay. Uh, that uh, I wanted to thank uh, uh, the uh, leadership of this wonderful um, society for inviting me here. Um, I really appreciate very much all they're doing uh, in their various important capacities for this great organization. And, um, and uh, it's been really exciting to uh, really uh, be here and also uh, to an honor to share the podium today with the outstanding presenters that have uh, talked uh, about so many uh, exciting developments in, um, in biomedical science um, uh, and also technological innovation, uh, diversity and inclusiveness, and the need for cultural change in support of uh, women in, in the life sciences field. I want to um, also um, mention at the outset that my organization, the American Association for Cancer Research, uh, really um, which has been in existence since 1907, it was the first cancer organization to be formed of any type, really shares your mission uh, to advance uh, the role of women, to advance scientific research by showcasing um, women and their important contributions uh, to the field for the benefit of all mankind. So um, again, uh, I'm so happy, and I'm also very happy to have uh, five of my valued colleagues here, the senior staff of the AACR, and I know they're enjoying the presentations as well, and uh, they themselves are highly effective women professionals. So I uh, would like to just also thank at the outset Rosalind Franklin, who uh, contributed her major insights into the discovery of molecular structure of DNA. And I know all of you already know all about this. I actually was a little surprised when I read a little more and, and realized that Wilkins was in the picture also, although he's very, almost never mentioned um, uh, when they elucidated the double helix structure of the molecule. And, um, and also, uh, through her work on the structure of viruses, she really helped to lay the foundation for the field of structural virology, which I think rarely gets mentioned, but it's really, um, it was exciting to learn a little bit more about that. Sadly, as we know, her cutting edge research was cut short when she died of cancer. Um, uh, in 1958 at the age of 38, uh, which was um, really devastating to the world and continues to be a, a really a monumental loss to the field. So today I'd like to uh, describe the current status of cancer research and the vital role of the ACR in the cancer field, highlight the extraordinary uh, contributions of women in cancer research and biomedical science, and also discuss um, some of the causes of gender inequities and strategies to maximize the impact of women in science and medicine. Um, a number of the things I'll mention at the end have already been underscored all day today, so I'll, I'll breeze through those, but I did want to uh, just give you um, uh, an outline of what I wanted to say. So first of all, um, what is the status of cancer research? Uh, Dr. Hockfield really dealt with uh, some of this, but I, will, I think that I, I will cover some uh, material that she hasn't mentioned uh, in her brilliant uh, presentation. So first of all, um, uh, we're, we're we are encountering a, a greater translation of basic science to the clinic. Um, with an emphasis on precision medicine, immunotherapy, and combination of therapies. All of this is really um, uh, exciting the field right now, uh, both senior and junior scientists. Cutting edge uh, technologies are offering new ways to study cancer biology, its initiation, and really how to potentially intercept its uh, progression. Uh, data science is, and real world evidence is on everyone's lips now. AI was mentioned earlier today. Uh, that hold uh, enormous promise for uh, Im improved clinical outcomes. We have faster drug development, faster FDA approvals of new and exciting cancer therapeutic agents. And interestingly uh, to me, um, uh, since I've been around a long time and hadn't seen too much collaborations in the old days, there are a lot more collaborations among scientists and physicians and also across subdisciplines and institutions, which um, is really leading to, um, incre I should say, accelerating uh, breakthroughs uh, against cancer. And novel funding models, and we heard uh, about a number of those today, the team science models are really exciting everyone. So this, this surge in innovation is really moving the field forward. Um, in all aspects of, of cancer research, from biology, early detection, and diagnosis, to treatment, 
d increasingly uh, d disease surveillance and improved patient care. So when we look at the evolution um, uh, of the therapeutic pillars of cancer care, it's interesting that surgery was, um, you know, is, which is a very old modality, uh, way back to the ancient times, is obviously still extremely important, uh, along with radiotherapy and cytotoxic chemotherapy. Uh, however, molecularly targeted therapies and immunotherapy are coming into uh, great usage. What is, um, of course, of great concern to all of us is the toxicity that is resulting from combination of therapies and also immunotherapy alone. However, uh, things are moving forward with an, at an exciting pace, and you can see in the slide that, that we have uh, doubled the number of drugs uh, introduced over the past decade, and so uh, that would include immunotherapeutic agents, and it's exciting to see that and important for patients. Now, uh, the, um, we have, uh, over the past year, uh, introduced new anti-cancer therapeutics, which are now benefiting uh, patients with various types of cancer. And, um, and I mentioned tissue agnostic therapies because um, uh, these advances in cancer biology that we are experiencing um, are really helping us to develop new trial designs. And this, again, is also um, uh, helping us to uh, bring more uh, tr good treatments to patients. And also, there, are, there were 10, just in this past year, uh, previously approved anti-cancer therapeutics for treating new cancer types. So um, uh, the patients are benefiting the rapid pace of discovery just over this past year up until July 20, uh, 2019, and it's increasing, is really uh, bringing um, much more hope to more patients with all types of cancer. Just a couple of weeks ago, there was an article and a presentation, actually, in one of our meetings in Boston, where data uh, from both preclinical and clinical trials were, were shown uh, that there were there are two new drugs, uh, AM, one Amgen and one Marathi drug, uh, both of which are now inhibiting um, uh, a KRAS mutation, G12C. And these are, are amazingly being shown to actually be uh, showing uh, that, that we can um, drug previously undruggable cancer targets. And of course, again, new hope for many patients uh, who, have, um, who, are, who did previously have uh, unmet uh, treatment needs. So everybody's very excited about the clinical efficacy of just these agents because KRAS, which uh, the National Cancer Institute put a lot of money into, had not really shown any efficacy or anything going on for quite a number of years, including a couple of decades. Now, I mentioned uh, the faster pace of FDA approvals of immune checkpoints, and this slide really shows very definitively that uh, as of uh, August 1, 2016, we had um, five new indications for, um, for new um, uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors, uh, and then just the following year, eight, and, and now this year, 17. So things are moving very fast. Um, in fact, everybody's teasing us about our annual meeting being an immunology meeting only um, when, uh, you know, it turns out it's about 30 percent of the meeting now. Um, the Japanese are already watching that and said that their meeting was only 10 percent and, uh, and that they need to catch up to us. So there's been some interesting comment about that. We have to make sure, however, that we don't go overboard. Um, on the immunotherapeutic angle. So recent dramatic clinical progress against cancer uh, uh, shown in this slide shows that in, in enormous numbers of uh, new opportunities for new indications, not only with uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors, but also anti uh, angiogenesis inhibitors, uh, cell death promoting agents, cell signaling inhibitors, a variety of, of ways to really do better things in treatment. And I couldn't be happier to see that. I've been around a long time, and I have to tell you that um, there's enormous excitement, and of course, it's resulted in many more uh, grant applications going into the National Cancer Institute, as you've probably heard. There's also a spotlight on early detection and cancer interception. Um, I believe that uh, Dr. Hockfield mentioned that as well. Uh, and the importance of that, of course, is that patients who are diagnosed with cancer uh, er very early have higher survival rates. And the new concept of cancer interception, um, you know, is, is becoming very exciting to people. Companies are starting to, uh, to actually uh, put money into 
cancer interception that really um, is a, a way of intercepting uh, early in, in the progression spectrum from either precancer lesions or early stage cancers. But of course, what we need is more uptake on these screenings. And, and we're have, we hold great hope for liquid biopsies, uh, which are non-invasive and much easier to, um, for people to actually access. Now, uh, one of the things that the public doesn't know uh, very much is that um, about 50% of the cancers can actually be prevented. And, um, you know, tobacco was mentioned earlier today, but you'll see that there are many other risk factors that are involved. And also, it gets really bad when you combine more than one risk factor. So we really need to do better uh, in this. And of course, obesity, um, and I'm pretty chubby myself, so I, I hesitate to show you these data. But you can see that we're all getting heavier. Men and women are getting heavier. And, uh, and this is not a good sign because it does result in some serious consequences for patients. So um, although we have, um, we, I wanted to show this slide because it does show a, 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 that we have a lot of progress against cancer in the increase of survivors from 3 million in 1971, which was when the National Cancer Act was, was formed. Was, was approved, and, uh, and now um, over 16.9 million survivors this year expected to go up by the time the National Cancer Act has its 50th anniversary, and we're already working uh, on uh, how we're going to acknowledge that in 2021 at our annual meeting. And in the last 25 years, there's been a 27% reduction in cancer death rate. Again, more than 2.6 million lives saved, which is wonderful. However, um, there's a lot more to do, as has been said, and uh, cancer is predicted to become an even greater uh, challenge in the United States going forward, largely because we are an aging population. And you'll see that by 2040, we're looking at the potential of having over 2.3 million new uh, US uh, cancer, uh, cancer cases and uh, all, over 963,000 deaths in just one year alone. 54% of the U.S. cancer cases are diagnosed in, in people age over 65. And you can see the, the number of people who are, project, are projected to be older um, by 2040 is 81 million. I think it was um, quite interesting uh, to hear uh, Dr. Hockfield say that in 2050, um, there will be about 10 billion people on the planet so I wonder even if these numbers are actually accurate or if they are perhaps understated. And there's a looming crisis uh, around the world in cancer. Uh, one of the things we're seeing, which was very surprising, was that cancer deaths are now more common than those from cardiovascular disease. In adults aged 35 to 70, this is very new data, and, and a little bit surprising because we, we really didn't, we always uh, thought that the increasing global burden was really going to be shouldered by the less developed regions of the world. Uh, whereas, in fact, um, there could be as many as 30, uh, 27.5 million new cases by 2040 um, or around the world with 16.3 million deaths. Again, wondering about that uh, close to, uh, to um, 10 billion people in, on the planet, uh, we have to worry about that as well. So uh, lots, to, lots to worry about when we think about um, uh, our challenges in cancer research. Now, I, I do um, wanted to just talk about, just for a few minutes, about uh, what we really need to meet these challenges. And, and of course, we know we have to foster innovation in basic and translational uh, cancer research uh, and increase patient accrual on novel, uh, in novel clinical trials. Of course, we need personnel. We need the best minds. And of course, that would, does include women. Uh, improved biomarker uh, development at validation and standardization. And, and of course, as we talked about data sharing, uh, lots of Im important new um, information has to be shared in large, expensive databases that uh, many of our um, men and women in this field are, are, are working to enhance. We need to address healthcare disparities to ensure equitable and affordable treatment options. And, um, and our organization is very strong on cancer disparities research, and we're hoping to make um, further um, inroads against um, uh, this area. 
we're even doing a progress report, the first progress report uh, ever uh, ever published uh, on cancer disparities um, uh, in uh, in the U.S. and also uh, attract and sustain a robust cancer workforce for the future, which is of course the major topic today. Uh, hoping that we will be able to provide adequate research funding, as has been said, you know, no money, no mission. Okay, so we know that the foundations that are represented here, as well as the government. Are, are very, very important in this equation to keep, uh, keep people in the saddle. Uh, I want to advocate for regulatory policies that result in accelerated uh, drug approvals. And, um, and of course, uh, Dr. Hockfield mentioned uh, healthcare access, accuracy, and cost being major areas that I had not included here, but def definitely of importance. So we need to work to expedite the number of breakthroughs consistent with the scope and the complexity of the cancer problem. Uh, as far as we're concerned, and obviously you all, you all represent other diseases as well. So what is AACR doing? So we, we want to fundamentally change the face of cancer by being the most effective catalyst for the prevention and cure of all cancers. And uh, since we were founded in 1907 and we are the largest cancer research organization in the world, we feel an enormous responsibility to do better. But how do we do better? We need a multidisciplinary cancer research um, uh, workforce that includes the, the valued women that we've talked about uh, today and all that can be done and we hope we will be able to accelerate the conquest of cancer through those mechanisms. Now we have uh, over 44,000 members um, residing in 120 countries and they're working across the whole spectrum of cancer research. There are about 18,000 young investigators. Um, women represent over 41 percent of the membership. When I started in this job uh, we had 14 percent. Um, minority scientists represent 15%. When I started, it was less than 2%. So we, we are uh, doing much better in the, in the way of diversity, and I think it's important to really uh, continue to, to, uh, down that road because, as we know, uh, when, we, when we look at the medical schools, women are representing 50% of the graduating classes, and I guess it's close to that for PhDs. We, are, we have a, a, a scientific niche that I think is very important in that it it ranges throughout the whole uh, spectrum of, of research, of course, basic translational clinical research, which I've already mentioned. We also focus on molecular epidemiology and population science and convergence science, which was, of course, Dr. Hockfield's comment as well. Um, uh, we interact a lot with MIT, so I know the importance of, of this area indeed and, um, and how it's bringing together life sciences with the physical uh, sciences, engineering and math, et cetera, to really look at cancer in a very different way since we know that um, tumors evolve and the mathematical uh, approach to these things is going to be very important going forward. So we, we really are a ripe environment for the discussion of um, a lot of different areas of cancer research and we and we just <laughs> we were laser focused on identifying the latest in, in scientific priorities to advance progress and of course I'm not going to go through uh, through all this but I wanted to just mention a couple of these because uh, they are on our radar right now aging and cancer which was already mentioned in one slide is something we're trying to uh, focus on and see how we can uh, attack that problem of course, uh, cancer disparities research, which I've already mentioned, and convergence. But uh, an area that's coming forward now and very strongly is now DNA damage response, with a, which a number of the pharmaceutical companies are, are uh, investing in, uh, and I'm sure that Aaron probably is looking at that as well. Um, also, uh, hematologic malignancy is getting very strong and how we can extrapolate from blood cancers to, to, to solid tumors. And I wanted to... Um, in this column, I wanted to specifically call out pediatric cancer research because a lot of people think that pe pediatric cancer has been cured because blood cancers are, are, um, are largely um, uh, the survival in blood cancers is, is good, um, usually over 90%. But in fact, brain cancers in children is absolutely terrible. But also, as we're looking at survivorship research, we're realizing that something that, by the way, the University of Penn is very strong on is cardio-oncology. Um, these children will, if they don't die from cancer, ultimately throughout their lives, many of them will die of cardiovascular disease. And so survivorship research is becoming a new thing for us to really think about something we hadn't looked at before. So uh, discovery, translation, um, uh, application, all 
part of what we need to work on. So what are the extraordinary contributions of women to cancer research? So um, what is clear is that the professional success of women scientists and physicians is absolutely essential for rapid progress against cancer. Anybody who doesn't know that is, is, is clueless. The, the contributions of women have been pivotal to advances in cancer research, patient care, and, and public health. It has been demonstrated that, that heterogeneous re research teams uh, that include diverse uh, people from diverse backgrounds, nationalities, and genders are more innovative. They produce higher quality science and they result in better outcomes. And also the integration of women at all levels of oncology, and I'm sure this applies uh, across the board to biomedical science, will ensure that the cancer workforce reflects the gender diversity of the popula population it serves. We uh, have a, a bunch of women rock stars in this field. and. Um, I thought it was interesting going through this, uh, this list, which I had actually prepared for another talk some time ago. Um, I thought I would yellow mark those that are actually uh, either have been or involved in your organization or currently on your board. Um, a couple of them are past presidents I can see. Dr. Blackburn and Dr. Horowitz are, are very active board members of this organ great organization. And so we're thrilled that they could be active, but there are many, many members that are also on your board that are not even mentioned. So I wanted to um, maybe inspire you a little bit by uh, talking a little bit about the early pioneers in cancer research. Uh, when we look back in history, the history of the AACR, it's interesting that Martha Tracy, um, who's, you know, can you imagine she was born in 1876, was the first female member of the AACR in 1908. What's interesting about this is that uh, she worked very closely with uh, our founding member, William Coley, who was known as the father of immunotherapy and made significant contributions to, the, uh, to this area of investigation. Most people don't recognize that she was there helping him, working on this. And she did get you know, a significant positions as dean of, 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 of Women's Medical College of Pennsylvania in Philly. But what I think is also interesting is that history doesn't really talk much about her when they talk about immunotherapy in the old days. Of course, think about that. We're now bragging about immunotherapy, and it was 100, oh, more than 100 years ago that this is being thought about by Coley and Tracy. Also, another one that's, who I think is interesting is Maud Sly. Um, she dedicated her career to basic cancer research, and she was the first woman at the age of 34 to actually present the first paper by a woman at, at, uh, at a meeting that originally our organization was called the American Society of Cancer Research and later was named AACR. Now, she also had a, a big job, was given a big job in, in, in Chicago, became full professor, and so on. Uh, and I think in her, uh, in her own right, she has some recognition. And Thelma Dunn, uh, who's a spectacular, uh, who was a spectacular pathologist uh, and became director of the lab at NCI, was the first woman president of the AACR as far back as six decades ago in 1961-62. And that's wonderful to think about, but unfortunately, uh, her election as president was not an immediate cultural breakthrough. We've been talking a lot about cultural change today. Uh, for no woman was elected ACR president between 62 and, and 75, even in the era of the women's liberation movement. So again, um, not an immediate change. I had the honor of, um, of really working with Dr. Elian. She was president of the AACR in 83, 84, which was right around the time that I became um, executive director, CEO. And, uh, and she, as you know, um, received the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine in 1988, uh, along with George Hitchings. What was interesting about this is that he supported her, her candidacy and, her, uh, and we, we learned later that she was probably the brains of the group, uh, proposing uh, of the two, uh, uh, proposing a lot of, um, uh, uh, of new uh, anti-cancer and antiviral agents uh, that were extremely beneficial and many of which are still being used today. But when, when I would hang out in some of the receptions and so on, I would hear the guys say, well, she was just a technician, um, which irritated me to no end, um, mainly because she did not actually um, earned directly her doctor of science. She actually, this was an honorary degree because she never wanted to stop doing her science. And so um, uh, at least the Nobel Prize um, uh, Committee 
uh, recognized her and her importance. Another uh, one who I think is particularly interesting and relevant to our discussion today uh, is Elizabeth Blackburn, who discovered uh, telomerase along with um, her mentee, Carol Greider, and Jack Sostak. Um, she was president of the ACR in 2010-2011, in um, and here too, uh, she was very generous in bringing in her, her mentee, uh, Carol Greider. In some cases, as we know, that doesn't happen so easily. And so we always appreciate those individuals, whether they be male or female, who really, um, as has been said, grab a woman and bring them along and help them uh, from various in various ways. And of course, this is Carol Greider. Um, she has not um, really is not as well known as, as Liz Blackburn, and I know Liz is on your board, uh, but I wanted to just mention her, of course, because of her, her key role in, in the Nobel Prize. And since I know that there's a, now a CRISPR journal, last time I, uh, I guess I learned about that this morning, um, um, I wanted to mention CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing uh, to really uh, say that these two women uh, who actually were inducted as fellows of the ACR Academy in 2017, probably will get the Nobel Prize soon. I think they're on the list um, for this discovery, this very important discovery that has uh, major um, implications for medical research and cancer science um, going forward. So we're very proud of them as well. I would be remiss if I didn't mention Dr. Jaffe, who was last year's president, who's a world authority in immunotherapy. And again, to inspire you to realize this, she is the first woman chair of the National Cancer Advisory Board, um, at which, uh, I, I mean, it's unheard of. This board's been in existence since the signing of the National Cancer Act in 1971. So she, she has been appointed, and she's doing a great job, and was last year's president, and was also active in the Blue Ribbon Committee, and Dr. Martis, our, our current president, very distinguished uh, scientist who is really uh, doing great things in precision medicine and pediatric research. All these women, all 14 women presidents, um, uh, some of whom are, have been or are on your board, um, are, are fantastic role models for, for young in, women investigators going forward, but only 14 out of over 112 years, you see. So again, lots more work to be done in this area. So in summary from this section, I wanted to say that um, the historical evolution of cancer research obviously has been, has been really accelerated and made possible by the expertise and the dedication of, of these and other remarkable women. We've come a long way, but, but um, as has been said and just, uh, and just said by Dr. O'Shea, uh, we're moving at a slow, inadequate, and, and inconsistent pace. And we need more women in leadership roles in science and medicine if we're really going to continue to make major inroads against cancer and all the other challenging diseases of our time. So what are, what are the root causes of, of these inequities? Well, we've talked all day long. I don't want to be repetitive, but I do want to just um, show you a couple of slides, at least from my perspective. Uh, you'll see that uh, from this slide that um, about 60% of the undergraduates <laughs> are women, and it does slow down, and you've seen these data today in a couple of, uh, by, uh, given to you by a couple of presenters. The real question is, why is that happening? I, you know, some years ago, I was working with uh, Bridget Leventhal, who would, uh, when she was alive before she died of cancer, was very active in, in our sister organization, ASCO. And we had a study going, and we could never figure out what it was. It isn't just about women having babies. I mean, there's something else happening here that we need to find out. Um, so uh, there's some speculation about why the leaky pipeline exists for women in this field. And although there is overt discrimination against hiring women, um, uh, in, and it continues, uh, it has lessened, and, it, and it has, in some cases it's disappeared entirely in certain institutions, there are, as has been said today, unconscious biases still persisting, and, uh, and they are evident in the low numbers of women hired for senior positions. Um, my brother, who used to be an insurance executive, um, I asked him, because I knew he was a male chauvinist, and I said to him, how many, how many women, I knew him very well, okay, he's, he's still around. But anyway, uh, I said, how many women do you have in your leadership? You know, this was, uh, he was president of Mutual New York, very young guy at the time. And uh, he said, I have uh, five out of 10 senior positions. And I said, wow, five of 10 for you? How did that happen? He said, it's good business. 
It was a good business decision. So you see that has to be um, reinforced, and I have a couple of slides to really mention that further. Women are only half as likely to get excellent letters of recommendation, and they're about 10 to 20 percent less likely than men to become independent principal investigators. Again, why is that? They're getting um, m much less money in startup funds, and, uh, and of course family issues persist. Um, uh, for everyone, but especially women. Uh, however, we really need to do some more research to figure out what the nature of these other unknown reasons um, is and try harder to work for change. Um, apparently, according to the men, uncertain job markets and uh, the choice of the wrong subdiscipline would be the reasons why they wanted to leave their scientific or medical careers. Women may hesitate to apply for tenure track jobs because of the shortage of female role models. And this really is of concern to me because uh, there are role models in women, but frequently they, they're not uh, helping to the extent that we need them to help. So I'll mention that in a moment. Gender bias also has the potential to adversely affect funding. And again, without funding, uh, people can't really have, um, have good um, uh, you know, uh, CVs with great publications. And of course, uh, studies show that women lack confidence and underestimate their abilities. This really worries, worries me a lot. Um, I wanted to mention my brother again, if you don't mind. Uh, so he, um, he was a young guy, and he was even cocky in those days. I thought he was quite insufferable. But, um, but well, one of the things he said was, you know, I, I have to show confidence, you know. I, and, um, and, of course, he did. I thought it was excessive. But at the end of the day, he became the youngest insurance pre uh, president of an insurance company in the history of, of, of the, the business. And um, so at age 40, he was making millions of dollars. The one, one, he was smart, but a lot of people are smart. The question is, um, did people see that confidence and have confidence back in him? And I suspect that's what was happening, and I think that women don't do themselves any favors by, by not having confidence in themselves and underestimating their abilities. And of course, I also wanted to mention that um, you know, some people are look askance um, at women who, who behave like men in the workplace. I'm, my sense is there that level of competitiveness that is perceived as being incompatible with acceptable female behavior is also kind of there. There are a number of uh, root causes of gender inequities, which I won't go into here because some of it is repetitive, but I also wanted you to know that the, um, the European Society of Medical Oncology uh, has done the survey and is focused on the lack of work family balance as one of the greatest challenges for at least these uh, medical uh, doctors, medical uh, oncologists. And, uh, and inadequate leadership skills, I would underscore because, and something that's on, uh, be in my bonnet right now, I think as, institu as organizations, we need to really figure this out and see how we can offer more opportunities in, in, uh, in training women for, for in leadership. I, I, sometimes I look at the board, our board of directors, and we've always had a lot of women on our board and either sometimes women speak too much or they don't speak at all. And so the, you know, the, we need to train people, if it doesn't come naturally, uh, to know how to handle themselves in the boardroom as well as in other environments. And uh, of course, some of these issues can be mitigated by proactivity on the part of women themselves or, uh, and their mentors. Uh, I thought that you might want to see this slide, um, which uh, contains a quote from Sir Peter Medawar, who's a very interesting uh, early uh, scientist, the father of transplantation. And he says here, the case for re rejoicing in the increasing number of women who enter the learned professions has nothing primarily to do with providing them gainful employment, although I, I would disagree with that. We would need to give them gainful employment or giving them an opportunity to develop their full potential. It is above all due to the fact that the world is now such a complicated and rapidly changing place that it cannot even be kept going, let alone improved, without using the intelligence and skill of approximately 50% of the human race. OK, you go, you go, you go, Peter Medawar. We like what you say. And the other thing about a business decision is uh, Prime, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe gave this speech in, t in 2013, and it was written up in Time magazine, an article yeah. called, You Mean Women Have Brains? And, and, and in, in that article, uh, it was mentioned that creating an environment in which women find it comfortable to work and enhancing opportunities for women to work and be active in their society, and you know the Japanese society is not so open for Japanese women, 
they seem to embrace women from outside the country more than inside, um, is no longer a matter of choice for Japan. It's instead a matter of the greatest urgency. Again, it's a business decision, and that's something that we need to really underscore. So what are some of the strategies? Well, of course, we've heard about mentors and how they need to be available for their students and coach mentees to the extent possible, uh, motivate and inspire, provide networking opportunities, uh, really, and help with internal as well as external re uh, recognition of mentees, and provide also psychosocial counseling when needed. We have a Women in Cancer Research Council that has been in existence for 30 years, and we frequently ask them to please uh, nominate uh, people for awards, and, and whatever, for whatever reason, these women do not do that. So we really need to, I guess they get busy so they can't really uh, handle that matter, but we need to, again, tell them it's a responsibility. There's a vital role of sponsors. We know what a sponsor is now. Many people need sponsors, therefore having male sponsors can be very important and very career changing. I can tell you in my case, um, I was also, as, as, as has uh, Aaron uh, benefited from this, um, been very fortunate to have male, several male sponsors throughout my career and I'm really very uh, encouraged by that. Professional organizations uh, need to um, uh, uh, help with uh, gender inequities and I already mentioned leadership training, networking opportunities, but uh, we need to obviously also change the culture even among the women um, in those uh, situations. And, and you can see the data here show that uh, ACR is doing pretty well in leadership positions for women at 46.7%, but there are other organizations at 7%, 14, 28%. There's an enormous um, amount of um, uh, change that needs to be happening in our own societies, and we can start there. And of course, also institutions can do a great deal, starting with equal pay for equal job, right? And, and of course, again, also training. I'm, I'm rushing because I can see in the left uh, corner of my eye someone standing <laughs> waiting for me to finish. So I'll, I'll get, try to get through this very quickly now. Um, so I wanted to underscore also the, the role of the individual because um, the individual has to be, be, uh, be helpful to himself or herself, but also needs to reciprocate and help those who follow the individual. And I feel very strongly about this because I have to tell you confidentially in my own world, uh, I've had four minor problems in my career and they've all been with women. And that has pained me cons a lot. And so I, I, I really uh, wanted to show you this slide, which says the responsibility of women to women is great. When women support each other, incredible things happen. Young women scientists frequently feel, and I know this from, from lectures I've given, that they're not getting the support from their, their female senior people. And, um, and we definitely need to change that picture. And as Madeleine Albright says, there's a special place in hell for women who don't help other women. We can't agree with her more. So in summary, the contributions of women scientists and physicians are absolutely essential to the future of, of research of, of any type. The full intellectual potential has not yet been exploited for the benefit of patients, and we need to work on that. Uh, we need more role models, mentors, and sponsors for women, both male and female. And they must be increased in number so that we will have those inspirational catalysts for progress. And of course, we need new policies, national and international policies that will emphasize uh, gender inequity. And we need to emulate the spirit of the of legend, legendary uh, Rosalind Franklin. She had a relentless work ethic and a dedication to science, which has, written, has been written in many, many um, publications. It's incredible to read about her and to see how intense and concise and direct with a passionate and determined spirit that she had. And she understood the importance of questioning authority, but respectfully. And she was herself a strong mentor for colleagues and her research assistants. So I think in, in it's remarkable to reflect on the fact that her, her pioneering science not only helped um, Watson, Crick, and Wilkins get the, the Nobel Prize in, uh, for, for DNA, but she also helped the Nobel Prize in chemistry. Aaron Klug, apparently her work predated his work and for which he got a Nobel Prize in, in 1982. So I think it, it suffice it to say that her extraordinary legacy will be really felt forever, and there's a bright 
uh, future ahead for women in science and medicine. Uh, as you can see from the goddess of victory, Victoria says, we need to really work together better to be victorious in achieving the dream of, of gender and equity toward the goal of improving um, the lives of all of us and, and for basically conquering all disease. So thank you very much. Thank you.